Hey, this is Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. Today we're talking about Y chromosome molecular clocks from the shore of a river in the most beautiful valley I've ever seen in my life. I'm in Cody, Wyoming to give a series of evening lectures and I asked the locals, where can I go to get a good shot? And they told me, just go west of town and take the South Fork. Well, I didn't know what that meant, but the road split, so I went left and wow, this is Fam phenomenal. I cannot believe how pretty it is here, at least in the middle of summertime. I'm pretty sure it's kind of bitter in the winter, but the snow might be also majestic. I'm right near the Buffalo Bill Cody Reservoir. I, have, um, I actually stirred up a rattlesnake about 10 minutes ago. There are bear warning signs everywhere. This is a uh, settled country, but there's still a lot of nature to, uh, to experience. But getting back to the topic, we're talking about Y chromosome molecular clocks or the lack of a Y chromosome molecular clock. In order to do something like date Y chromosome Adam or mitochondrial Eve, you need to know how fast mutations occur. Because you can look at all the people in the world, you can see how far apart they are. The next question is, how long does it take to build up all those mutations? Well, if you knew the rate of mutation, you could easily extrapolate backwards in time to put a date on Y chromosome Adam, the father of all living people, or mitochondrial Eve, the mother of all living people. Now, of course, the evolutionary Y chromosome Adam, mitochondrial Eve are not the creationist Adam and Eve. They're not the same thing. The evolutionary thing is basically a mathematical extrapolation. Once they realize there's only one Y chromosome ancestor and one mitochondrial ancestor of all the people in the world, they invoked a population bottleneck where most of all of the other lineages, or actually all the other lineages, were lost except one over time. So mathematically, this will happen in a small population. You're going to get one ancestor for the man and female, just at random. Biblically, we started off with only one man and only one woman. So we both kind of have the same idea, but we're coming at it in very different ways. And it would be really nice if we knew how fast mutations occur so that we could figure out how long ago those two individuals lived. The evolutionary timing for Y chromosome Adam, it depends on who you're talking to and it depends on what's, uh, what year you're talking about because the, the number has been revised a lot. Somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, depending upon the mutation rate and which branches you're talking about, there was actually a discovery of a brand new uh, Y chromosome branch from Africa. Um, they named them A00. That's like a, the double root of the human Y chromosome tree. And that one discovery doubled the time to Y chromosome Adam. They used to say, oh, you dumb creationists, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondria leave didn't even live at the same time. They were tens of thousands, if not 100,000 years apart. But that one discovery actually put them in about the same ballpark. Now, I don't hold to that. I don't care what they say the timing is because I don't agree with it. But it's just interesting to note that the timing is very much dependent upon what we know about the tree and what branches are on the tree. And if you find a really long branch with a really deep root, well, then you have to back the time up to when that ancestor may have lived. One of the big problems we have when trying to figure out how long ago Adam and Eve lived is we don't actually know the mutation rate. We can measure families and we can measure different people. We know how far apart they are as, as far as the number of generations is concerned. And we can say, okay, this many generations equals this many mutations. Except the machines that we use to sequence DNA have an error rate. And the error rate is about the same as the mutation rate we expect to see. So in order to get a mutation rate, you have to use very highly filtered data. And as scientists are filtering the data and doing quality control steps and removing spurious results, um, they're probably removing real mutations. It's just, how do you know? And so they try to shy away from what I call the genealogical rate. That is, take two people that are closely related, measure up the differences between them, and then you can calculate a rate based on that. But the data just aren't accurate enough to do that. So there are other ways to approach this. One method is what I call the phylogenetic rate. Take two species, find some DNA they have in common, count up the number of differences between those two pieces of DNA, and then divide by the time since their most recent common ancestor. So generally talking millions of years and a finite number of differences, we'll divide that small number by millions and you get a very slow mutation rate. Another method is what I call the historical rate. And this is what's been used to date Y chromosome Adam. 
what they will do is they'll look at the family tree and they'll find a, a split point that points to a known historical event. So the most important papers for the Y chromosome, and the papers that were studying the data that got used for the Y chromosomes in the Thousand Genomes Project, they said that the peopling of the Americas is a, I quote, sanity check, unquote, as far as the rate is concerned. So they used a historical fixed point in time after they find branches in the, the tree of people related to Native Americans that are also found in Asia. They said, oh, well, that must equal the split time. They're assuming what, 12,000 years ago? That depends because they're arguing like cats and dogs about uh, when um, the humans arrived in America. And some people are saying they got here a lot earlier than Ice Age time. We just don't know. And all this is also all based on carbon dating. So carbon dating, which can't go back 100,000 years, but it can go back to the peopling of the Americas if it actually happened that long ago. Carbon dating is being used to estimate the time to Y chromosome atom. That's very curious. So we have three methods. We have the genealogical method, we have the phylogenetic method, and we have the historical method. And what we see in science is sometimes a combination of all those things, and they're trying to get those rates to be the same, but they're not. The genealogical method gives you a very high rate. The phylogenetic method, usually the rate is like 10 to the negative eight, or if you have a letter, it will change once in every 100 million years. Or given 100 million letters, you'd expect one mutation per year. Well, there are three billion letters in the genome, so that would give you about 30 mutations per year in the human genome. I think it's faster than that, but that's the evolutionary estimates. But all those things I just said assume that a molecular clock exists. They assume that mutations occur at the same rate in all populations across all time and all geography under all conditions. That's probably not true. I published something with some colleagues of mine at the 2008 International Conference of Creationism, and we showed two different methods of estimating differences in mutation rates. One of the charts we showed was, we just looked at the ancestor of all the major Y chromosome lineages and counted up the differences between the living people and their ancestor. And some groups simply had more mutations than other, even though they all arose about the same time. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who works at Answers in Genesis, has recently written a book called Traced. And in that book, he specifically says that some of the Y chromosome lineages have a higher mutation rate. So he and I are saying the same thing, but there is an aspect of political correctness here that's very delicate because some of the longest branches on the Y tree are African. And you cannot say Africans are more mutant than non-Africans. That's not politically correct. You just simply can't say it. But there are a couple of workarounds here because it's not true that Africans are more mutant than others. Everyone is mutant in different ways. Let me explain. First, the Neanderthals were an incredibly mutant population. There are diseases, genetic diseases, that occur in modern people today that have been traced back to Neanderthals. Africans have hardly any Neanderthal DNA. I have up to about 3%, depending on which estimate you're looking at, but about 3% Neanderthal DNA. So I and my fellow non-Africans have an additional mutation burden that Africans don't have. Everyone in the world is suffering under the curse. We're all mutant, we're all falling apart. Genetic entropy is still at play in all human genomes. Just some people are a little different than others. And when we're talking about some branches being longer or more mutant than others, you're talking about a very tiny fraction of the 60 million letter long Y chromosome. Then you throw in the non-African contribution of Neanderthals, and then you add a brand new paper by Ding et al. They were studying the Y chromosome data in the Thousand Genomes Project and the Human Genome Diversity Project, and they saw that different groups of people have different numbers of mutations. And they drew a tree, very similar to some trees that I've drawn. And they had charts very similar to Nathaniel Jensen's and my charts that show that some groups are more mutant than others. So he's coming from an evolutionary perspective now. They're saying the same thing. But they also noticed non-Africans also can have a higher mutation load, specifically in their tree, group G, which is associated with Central Asia and the Caucasus. Interesting, that's where we get the phrase Caucasian from, which is that horribly racist idea of the past that there were three main races, the Negroid, the Mongoloid, and the Caucasoid. Well, forget that, that's not true, but we get the word Caucasoid from the Caucasus, and haplogroup G, which is very common there, is more mutant than average. Also group C, Genghis Khan, I think, was a, belongs to group C. 
Group C is common in Central Asia and the Northern America is associated with the Inuit population. And Group D also is associated with Central Asia. But if you look at groups D and C on their tree and my tree, you will see that some of the internal branches themselves have different branch lengths. So within the group, some people picked up a lot more mutations than others. In fact, maybe twice or many more times that mutations in the same amount of time. And I say that because clearly everyone in group D or group C has the same common ancestor. And their descendants living in different places in the world, some of them mutated faster than others. So the mutation rate is not constant amongst the different branches. But then they went one step further. Most of the major sequencing efforts, they don't just take a cheek swab and then sequence the DNA out of the cheek swab. They will actually make a cell culture for all the people in the study. And so they can grow these cells, grow a massive amount of DNA, then anyone who wants the DNA can either ask for a frozen sample or a living sample of the cells or a giant DNA extract from the cells. And you can do that. But what Ding et al. did was they looked at the raw sequencing data, not the assembled Y chromosome data, but the raw sequences that were pulled from these, um, these cell cultures. And they showed that there's a higher rate of error in the Y chromosome families that have longer branch lengths on the tree. So in cell culture, those Y chromosomes are picking up more mutations than other branches in the other cell cultures. That means that there's something inherent in the genome of those individuals. There's something in the cells themselves that are adding to the mutation burden, and some more than others. Oh, that's very interesting. That means that there is no molecular clock for Y chromosomes. That means you cannot simply look at the difference between two individuals and count up the differences and know how much time has elapsed. It means that mutation rates differ according to the genetics of the population. Probably not the genetics of the environment because we're talking about cell culture here, not people living in you know, Central Africa versus Siberia. And it's probably not due to experimental error because these are two different studies, the, human, uh, the Thousand Genomes Project and the Human Genome Diversity Project. Different authors, different techniques, different laboratories. It would be really hard to say, well, all the samples you collected in this city in Africa have a high error rate because you made this mistake in your techniques when you have a different study using different techniques in different places coming up with the same answer. So in the end, we don't know how long ago Y chromosome Adam lived, and you cannot tell from the genetic data. But if you look at the genealogical rate, it's like one to three mutations per generation. Now Nathaniel Jensen helped tremendously by coming up with that number, and he searched and searched and searched through the, the supplemental material of several papers where they're actually going through their techniques of stripping out the data and getting rid of a lot of the mutations. And in his work, he showed, yeah, one mutation is accepted by a lot of people, but it's probably three. And if you have one to three mutations per generation, sometimes one, sometimes 10, because we now know the rate can be variable. But at that rate, it would take only a few thousand years for all the people in the world to trace back to Y chromosome atom. Well, that's it for today. I just want to give you a little tidbit of some new information coming out that's directly challenging evolutionary estimates of time. If you want to learn more, I'm going to have an article on this appear uh, on creation.com very soon, but I jumped the gun and I filmed this video before the article appeared just because I'm so excited about it. I wanted you to hear about it here first. There's more information on biblicalgenetics.com or go to my employer's website, creation.com. You can find a lot of things here on evolution, about timing, molecular clocks, genetic entropy, all those topics are covered on our website. If you'd like to help support Biblical Genetics, I have two ways to do that. One is through Patreon.com. Those are my long-term supporters, uh, monthly, and BuyMeACoffee.com. Most of the people there are just one-off donors. Some people donating regularly, but it's really there just for you know, $3, $6, $9. Hey, Carter, buy yourself a coffee. Here's a little tip. Thanks for your work. Be blessed, my friends. Trust the Bible. It is believable. It is true. And science supports Scripture.